The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. After these many months of video calls and social distancing, probably most of us don't need any convincing about the need for occasionally seeing others in person. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, we'll look back to two conversations that warned early on about the critical importance of spending time face-to-face -face rather than relying too much on digital connections. While the online space opens the world to each of us from the comfort of our homes, it's also been implicated in adding to social isolation and what has sometimes been called an epidemic of loneliness. Wide-ranging research has shown that online interaction, even video chats, are not the same as face-to-face -face interaction, and that the health impact of sustained isolation is equal to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Here are two conversations that explore why digital can't replace personal. The first is from our 2015 conversation with psychologist and author Susan Pinker. Then we'll hear from MIT professor and author Sherry Turkle in 2016 on the importance of conversation. What is the village effect? Well, the village effect is a metaphor that I'm using to kind of express the kind of social contact that we need to survive and thrive. Because let's face it, not all social contact is created equal. But it actually, the book gets its name from a real village. And that's a story too, because when I was talking about my last book, I was sitting in a lecture hall in Toronto, in fact, when I heard an amazing fact. An evolutionary biologist gave a lecture and stood up and said, there is only one place in the world where men live as long as women, or nearly as long, and it's an island in Italy called Sardinia, a remote area, and in that place, that's where men live as long as women. So I sat up in my seat, and I thought, I'm going to go there and find out what is going on, not only the social factors, but the science that explains this. And so that's why I gave the book that name. So you went to Italy, you I, talked to the men, you talked to the women, what would you find out? Well, I went to that remote part mm -hmm. of an island off Italy where, incredibly, there are ten times the number of centenarians as we have in Canada, and six times as many as there are in the Italian mainland, just 150 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. So there was something going on there, but one of the things I found out will be, I guess, resonant for you as a broadcaster, which is I arrived there, in fact, with my daughter who had just done a Zowski Fellowship, and we had a big, beautiful Marantz tape recorder, and we wanted to capture these centenarians on tape. And when we got there, every centenarian that we met was surrounded by this group of neighbors, friends, nieces, nephews, children, the priest, the shopkeeper, the barkeeper, and none of them could finish a sentence without being interrupted. So. Actually, the sound was not great, but that was the story. The okay. story is the interaction. And actually, the way you describe it in the book is quite lovely about how the younger people will do many things for the older people, wash them, bathe them, uh, help them, do whatever, which is really just not a part of most people's daily existence uh, in big cities, right? So we got we got a problem in big cities about this if we want to live longer and, and be healthier. Is that fair to say? It's not just in big cities. I would say in North America in general and most industrialized societies, the way you age is, as George Burns says, you know, having a happy, loving family, close-knit, loving family living in another city. <laughs> That's a great line. Yeah. Well, we, we are a very mobile <laughs> yeah. society, and that combined with the fact that people are living longer, so their friends and spouses and relations may die before they do or move away, combined with our digital intera increasing digital interaction means that most older folks spend a lot of time by themselves, and that just wasn't the case there. You know, one of the scientists said, you know, they're always surrounded by people there with whom they like to natter, and I love that word. Natter. Right. Mm -hmm because they're considered central. And one woman who I questioned about it, and I said, you know, really, you're with your uncle, you can't go out because he's a shut-in unless somebody comes to relieve you. No, isn't 
this a problem for you? And she said, you know, you, you just don't understand. These people are a treasure for us. This is an honor for me to look after my zeal. And so, of course, that's, there's a kind of cultural disconnect. But where it really started for me on this book is that the kind of social interaction that we get, not only later in life, but early in life, really matters. And it only matters, it can be transformative. It can affect how we learn, how we hold on to facts, how well we fight off infection, for example, or you know, if you have a serious knock, like a cancer diagnosis or heart disease, how well you recover from that. What's going on right here, right now, as you and I are having a face-to-face -face conversation, looking at each other in each other's presence, that's so beneficial that even if we had 10 times as much contact via our Blackberries or Skype or whatever else, it just wouldn't be the same. Well, first, there's a whole cascade of neurotransmitters and hormones that are released when the two of us are across the table like this. You know, I'm looking at your eyes, we're locking eyes, and when you move your arms, and I kind of wave my arms around a little bit too. And so this mimicry and synchrony is telling us in a very kind of vestigial way that we're, we're of one mind, okay? Hmm. And it makes me trust you more. Because, you know, that might be a bad thing well, when you're on say, television. I was going to say, you don't know me that well, that's why. Exactly, <laughs> right. But all of this, what's happening under the surface is that these neurotransmitters reduce stress, they give us a little dopamine rush so we feel rewarded, okay? And the stress gets tamped down not only right now but well into the future, okay? Mm. And this trust is not only something that happens now either but works into the future as well. So it's a very different interaction that we're having now than we would if you just sent me this question, these questions over email and I answered them. I'm sure you'd guess much more succinct responses. But the kind of uh, liveliness of the exchange and the synchrony, the back and forth that happens in a real conversation would be completely absent and the effects of that synchrony would be absent physiologically. So you've actually identified empirical scientific evidence that suggests it's not only more fun, but it's actually better for both of our health if we do it this way, if we communicate like this. Yes? Exactly, as long as we're not arguing. <laughs> well, we're not yet. Yes. The night is young. Right. Now, all right, actually, maybe we should start arguing right here, because I'm looking at one of the charts in your book, and I know when I saw this, I, I really was quite astonished by it. What reduces your chances of dying the most? This is the chart that's fairly early on in the book. And you've got ahead of exercise, ahead of getting a flu shot, ahead of giving up heavy drinking, ahead of not smoking, strong relationships and social support. It is that much more important to good health than all of those other things? Believe me, Steve, this was a shock to me too. And that's why it was so new to me, and, and I'm a psychologist, so I felt I should have known it, but that study was published in 2010. It is a meta-analysis of about 49,000 subjects, so it's not a small, eensy-weensy study. And what they did is they measured everything about people and their habits and then followed them through time with one question at the end. Who's going to still be alive and breathing at the end of seven and a half years? And then they looked at which factors were most predictive. So yes, believe it or not, more important than how thin or overweight you are, more important than how much you exercise or smoke or drink is your social interaction. But what's really interesting is it's not just your nearest and dearest who matter. It's also the larger circle. So this is why I call the book The Village Effect, because it's not just the people who you really depend on at times of need. That's what you call social support, and that is predictive but also what's called social integration. What scientists mean by that is the people that you cross paths with day to day. And there are many fewer of those people now that our lives are mi migrating online. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the shopkeeper that you might see every day if you're doing your shopping on foot, or the, the kiosk where you buy your newspaper every day, or if you go to work in a real office, your office mates who you do interact with face to face every day. Or, for example, if you participate in your community or play hockey. Let's talk of something Canadian. You, you, know, you, ha you play hockey once a week and then you go out for a drink with the guys every week. That would count. Those larger relationships are equally predictive of how long you live. So that's why what could be a provocative statement that 
your social integration can give you a two to 15 year lifespan advantage comes from that kind of social involvement, getting out there, participating. Are you now saying that there's empirical evidence that your recovery, that your ability to fight off illness is better if you have those social interactions in your life? Amazing as it seems, say for example, there was a study of 4,000 nurses who had breast cancer. And they found that the women who already had a diagnosis of breast cancer, who had larger in-person social networks, meaning people they saw face to face, had a four, were four times as likely as to survive their illness. Hmm. Okay, it doesn't predict whether or not you'll have the bad luck of getting that kind of terrible diagnosis, but it does help attenuate how the disease progresses. So you can't say, if I have this great circle of supportive friends, I won't get sick in the first place. You can't go there. No, I think that what you can say is that, you know, life for everyone includes some hard knocks. Hmm. And that your social contacts help you not only in the concrete way of providing the social support of visiting you in the hospital or, you know, bringing some kind of comfort food to you or, you know, driving you places where you need to go, but actually just sitting there with you and spending time with you is also having a huge impact on health. Loneliness kills, but in an age of social media where we are constantly connected, sort of, are we ironically at a greater risk of isolation in those circumstances? Yes, incredibly, because it gives us a certain type of connection, but it's, it's not really great at building trust and intimate social bonds. So, I mean, these kinds of online digital connections are fabulous for searching. They're wonderful for communicating little discrete bits of information. What they're not great at is what we're engaged in right now, that kind of dynamic give and take of uh, a true conversation or the kind of, you know, the little pats and high fives and fist bumps and so on that release that oxytocin. The digital can't, at least not yet, do that for us. And, and some emerging research is showing, really, that there are different parts of the brain that become activated in person versus when you have a more static type of communication. And those areas of the brain are associated with A, reward, okay, it feels mm -hmm. good, B, attention, and C, problem solving, social problem solving being able to understand what is that person thinking now? What is he gonna say or do next? But for those people who are watching us right now saying, wait a second, I can't be lonely. I've got 5,000 Facebook friends and 40,000 Twitter followers. I am bathing in the accompaniment of people, admittedly on social media. What's the response? Well, you know, when you put air quotes around a word before, mm -hmm. well, I would say most people put air quotes around friends. And, you know, I know it's probably breaking a cardinal rule to mention another media outlet, but, you know, I was listening to The Current last week, and Anna Maria Tremonti was interviewing homeless men, on, homeless people on the streets of Toronto when it dipped below 20. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, you know, she said, where do you go to warm up? And he said, I go to the library because I really love using the computers there. I'm a big fan of social media. He said, I love it. I have 10,000 Facebook friends, and nobody knows that I'm homeless. Boy, doesn't that sum it up? Hmm. Right. So, I mean, here he is. He's living on the streets in minus 20, and he doesn't have a friend who's close enough to hmm. him to know that he's, he's suffering. We now have an alternative. We can look at our phones and have our attention be wherever we want it to be and be with all the people in the whole wide world. And what we're losing when we sit down with a friend, with an intimate, in a business meeting, we're losing the, um, the desire and the ability to focus on the people we're with. And my book is a plea uh, to uh, remember all of the work the conversation does for us and to get back to it because we're losing a lot. Let me follow up with this because if you talk about reclaiming conversation, one could argue that we, we have never probably in the history of the world been in conversation more than we are right now. Uh, admittedly, not so much face to face, but via text, via social media, via Skype. I mean, aren't we always in conversation right now? 
Well, I'm talking about face-to-face -face conversation, or at least voice-to-voice -voice conversation, because um, there's something very particular about all that you get from seeing the face, the voice, the eyes, in real time, responding to you. And when we deny this to our children, when we turn away from them to, to look at a phone as they're tugging at our sleeves, when we you know, put our kids in strollers and, and don't talk to them, but text instead, when you see moms in the park and they're not talking to their kids, but they're sitting there as an opportunity to do their email in the park, we're losing the opportunity to build empathy, to build, in, em, to build intimacy, you know, this is the work the conversation does, and we're becoming uh, insensitive to this, and really it's come to a point where it's dangerous. I mean, just one statistic that's shocking, there's been a 40% decline in all the ways that we know how to measure empathy among college students. That's no good in the past, in the past 20 years. Uh, that's no good, that's, uh, and that's linked directly to the introduction of digital media into their lives. You do talk in the book about some of the experiments that have been done which, which will prove the statistic you just put out there. Do you want to let us in on one of those experiments? Yes. Well, actually, the one that just turned me around is that if you put a phone on the table between yourself and the person you're having lunch with, two things happen to that conversation. First is that it moves to trivial topics. Um, because people don't want to be interrupted and be talking about something really serious. They want to, if they're going to talk about something serious, they don't want a symbol on the table that at any moment that conversation could be interrupted. Hmm. And second, you feel less empathy, less connection, less of a stake with, to the person you're talking to. So if that person is your child, your lover, your colleague at work, um, that deteriorates, deteriorates the quality of our empathy, of our intimacy, of our ability to do business. And that's serious. That's no good. Has this book now made, and, the, and of course the process of writing this book, made you more skeptical about the positive powers of technology? No. Um, I think technology is awesome. I teach at MIT. I'm surrounded by people who are inventing the most exciting new things. But I think that te technology, as I put it, um, my favorite sentence in the book, technology has the power to make us forget what we know about life. <laughs> and that's not technology's fault. Uh, mothers know that when they're with their children, they need to talk to them, they need to read to them, they need to make eye contact with them and see their faces. Now, we have a technology that's so seductive that for a little bit of time, it lets us forget this thing that we know. And I think it's our job, after being seduced for a while by this shiny, bright object, to kind of pull ourselves together and say, you know, I love this technology, but I need to put it in its place. And I need to have the technology, but also reclaim conversation. One statistic that I think is very important, um, and I'm really not somebody who quotes statistics a lot, is that 89% of Americans say that they took out a phone during their last conversation. Mm. And 82% say that it deteriorated the conversation. I think it was a middle school in upstate New York which asked you to yes. come in and take a look around at what was happening because yes. the kids were not relating to each other in, in a way that the dean of the school thought was constructive and, and the dean was noticing some serious consequences. Fill yes, in that story I, if you would. At this school, um, uh, I was called in by the dean, by the faculty to consult because what they were finding is that students were so much relating to each other through their texts and through their messages and through social media that they were losing the capacity really to, to look at each other and to apologize, you know, to, 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 to read each other to empathize with each other, and, and really almost being cruel without meaning to be cruel, because they were not picking up on the signals from other children. What, one comment I think that the dean made was that 12-year-olds was that play on the playground like 8-year-olds, mm -hmm. and she was frightened. 
you know, she hadn't seen that. And when I consulted to the school, I mean, I saw that that really um, students would sit, you know, it was a story where students would sit in the lunchroom and they would not talk to each other. They would talk about what was on their phones. <laughs> and I think that it was such a good example of how quickly you can lose empathic response when you don't make eye contact. But I'm optimistic because other studies show how quickly, in fact, you can get it back. There's a study that shows that in only five days at a sleep-away camp where there are no devices, where students aren't allowed to bring laptops or cell phones or anything, um, the empathy levels which are depressed when kids come to the camp start to rise again. Hmm. And the question is, how does that happen? You know, what happens at this camp that's magic? And the answer is the kids talk to each other. And they say to me, uh, when I studied at a device-free camp, one, one young man says, I think he was 14, you know, when I'm at home, I, I talk to my friends about what's on our phones. At camp, we just talk about our feelings. If you don't teach your children to be alone, they will only know how to be lonely. Hmm. In other words, if you don't achieve the capacity for being alone, for being content within yourself, what you risk is that when you face other people, you kind of project onto them who you need them to be rather than who they really are, and you never really get into a true conversation with them. So basically, you know, being alone um, and, and allowing yourself to be bored, you know, means that you have a moment when you need to, you know, think about you. And th this is necessary. It's one of the signal achievements of childhood to be able to do this. And I say it's necessary because the capacity for solitude and the capacity for boredom is where creativity begins. It's where successful relationships, as I've just pointed out, begins. It's really where mutuality begins. It's where the capacity for mutuality begins. And in fact, ne neuroscience is now teaching us, I mean, just to show the point to which this extends, that we lay down our stable sense of our sort of autobiographical self through time in our moments of boredom. So when we experience boredom, our brains are not bored. Our brains are doing their most important, mm -hmm. it, uh, their most important work. But it, it gives you that momentary feeling, as he said, of, of alone. And now we have an alternative to never having to face that moment of, whoa, you know, I'm alone. I have to just reach within myself rather than be stimulated from the outside. And I study people, one of the places I study people is at stop signs and supermarket checkout counters. And, you know, when they have three minutes, three seconds, excuse me, at a stop sign, people take out their phone. Mm. That three seconds at a stop sign feels like too much to just tolerate. And three minutes at a checkout line is, is, is impossible. That's an eternity. It's an eternity. Mm -hmm. and, and these were times when people, you know, used to be able to just, you know, sit back and say, you know, what just happened? Nothing glamorous. I'm not talking about, you know, sort of, you know, facing existential dread like he's talking about or, you know, the life's deepest questions. But it was a moment to kind of collect yourself. And we absolutely are giving up those moments for self-collection and self-knowledge to our phones and to sort of the hit of stimulation. And it is a neurochemical hit of stimulation mm -hmm. that you get when you do a search, when you look at something, when you see an email. And here I'll just mention, you know, the neuroscience of this. I don't like to talk too much of addic about addiction because I find it, it, it sort of depress, it makes people think that this is too much to handle. You know, I'm addicted, I can't do anything. Turns out you can actually do something. You don't, you don't need to be constantly checking your phone. It isn't like heroin. So I don't like to talk too much about addiction. But it is true that we get a neurochemical high 
from checking our phones because it's new, it's social, it's stimulating. And you have to be willing to acknowledge that, recognize that you're vulnerable to it, and uh, design around that vulnerability. If you're going to go on a diet, you don't, you know, stock the refrigerator with ice cream and brownies. Let, let's pursue this notion of addiction that you just said, and I appreciate that it's not a perfect comparison. But, yes. But, but let's, let's run with this metaphor. If there is an addiction, and I'm sure there is for a lot of people with their devices, what's the beginning of a 12-step program to get us off it? Well, recognizing it, just like in a 12-step program, the first thing you do is recognize you have a problem. And what I find is changing now, but has been slow to change, is that people think of their phone as, I don't want to say a fashion accessory because that's a little strong, but let's just say like a fashion accessory. <laughs> you know, that's kind of there because it's wonderful, but sort of is just something they deserve and that um, is a wonderful part of modern life and um, hey, no cost. And I think that the first step is realizing that there is a cost and the, that can only begin and that's why the focus in my book is reclaiming conversation. It can only begin with a recognition of the work that conversation does for empathy, for intimacy, for work, for relationships. You cannot go to a board meeting with your phone, do email during the meeting, and expect that, you know, that meeting, that board meeting is going to get the same job done as when you didn't bring your phone. And yet a lot of boards you know, have been operating that way. Faculty meetings, classrooms, um, breakfast, dinner with your children. Um, I, I quote one um, young woman in my book who's, who's at camp and her dad takes her out to dinner while she's at camp and they're, they're having dinner and she's so happy to be with her dad and he pulls out a phone to check, you know, who was the cinematographer on some movie and she says to him, Daddy, please stop Googling. I just want to talk to you. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. In the digital age, algorithms shape more than meets the eye. We'll explore that tomorrow. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.